as we're gathered now to hear your word, we pray that you would come by your spirit and take your words of truth and bring them home to our hearts, causing us to delight in them, to want to obey them and be doers of your word, that we might bring you glory by our lives and that your kingdom on earth might expand to the praise of your glory. Help us now in this hour to internalize and to live out <coughs> the truths that we study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Does everybody have a handout? <coughs> if not, raise your hand. Michael and Josh uh, have handed them out. Uh, I don't want to put pressure on Jeremy in any way to do this on a regular basis, but it tends to be my pattern especially in Sunday school, but sometimes even in the sermon, although I don't have one for the sermon this morning. I want to state my purpose for this hour right up front. My purpose, my aim in this hour or 45 minutes is this. I want to convince you all of the value of connecting with your fellow Christians, brother to brother, sister to sister, on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, to invest in one another and to help one another to grow in grace. This is my aim. I want to encourage you and help you see the value of one-to-one -one ministry. As I've come to see the ministry of the church, at least the ministry within the church, the body of Christ to itself, we might look at it in concentric circles. The outside circle would be the large meetings of the church, the plenary meetings of the church, where everybody is supposed to show up. There's obviously God-directed worship, there's instruction, and there's some ministry to one another. And then moving out from that outer circle, we have small group gatherings. In, in our church, we have begun home groups of 8, 10, 12 people meeting weekly or bi-weekly, and there's great value, I, I think, to those home groups where they we get to minister more personally to one another. You already have some of those smaller meetings. I attended the men's meeting yesterday morning. There's a ladies Bible study. You already have small group meetings. And as you get larger as a church, by God's blessing, there will be even greater need to perhaps have home groups where there can be more concentrated, focused ministry to one another that we don't have in the larger meetings. But then moving from the outside to the inside, with Beyond the small group meetings, we might consider personal ministry, one-to-one -one ministry, brother-to-brother, sister-to-sister. I think this has often been called personal discipleship. I'm, I'm not going to call it that only because as I look at the New Testament, I don't find the word disciple or discipleship used a lot in the epistles. And I don't want to be one who just grabs hold of Christian buzzwords and fills them with meaning that the Bible doesn't. So I call it personal ministry. Another phrase I like comes from a book produced by um, uh, Capitol Hill uh, Church, Mark Dever over in Washington, D.C., a book uh, entitled Compelling Community. And they use the phrase spiritually intentional relationships. I like that phrase, and that's what I've used here as the title. Spiritually intentional relationships. That's what I want to talk about why and how we can build spiritually intentional relationships within the body of Christ. And I want to begin, as we should always begin, with some biblical bases for spiritually intentional relationships. Anything we do, we need to be authorized by the Word of God to do it, right? God doesn't call us to be clever and creative. He calls us to be obedient to His Word. And when we are, that will make for maximum edification and blessing. So what biblical bases might we have for encouraging these one-to-one -one personal relationships? You with me so far? Yes. Well, let's look at some of them. First of all, there's the general call to love one another. And I do want this to be interactive, so I'll be asking for volunteers to read scripture. <laughs> um, and let's do that quickly so we can redeem the time. I'm not going to ask you to read all the scriptures uh, for the sake of time, but I'll have you read some. First of all, there's the general call to love one another. Love, as you know, is a huge concept in the Christian life, isn't it? 
there's a sense in which we could say the hope of the Christian life is reducible to love. You remember the old Beatles song, some of you, my generation, all you need is love. Well, you know, if you take that and you put that in a biblical context, that's true. Why is that true? Why is love the summation of the Christian life? Come up with a statement. God is love. That's his essence. And what statement kind of reduces the whole of the Christian life to love in the full or biblical sense? The, the law is uh, fulfilled by love. Yeah. What, what is the sum of the law? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. So love is a huge concept. Um, what does 1 Corinthians 13 say? Anybody paraphrase? Love the, is the first three verses that talk about the importance of love. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Yeah. Um, it talks about have all... You want us to... Well, that's okay. I mean, Sorry. Love is I have to figure out. Without love, no, nothing, is, nothing is really... Without good. love, you're nothing, right? right. I'll, yeah. I'll turn you to some scriptures, not to all. But as it began us, you may speak with amazing eloquence, you may be a fountain of knowledge, you may have the faith to remove mountains, you may sacrifice all that you have, you can deliver your body to be burned as a martyr, but if you have love, it amounts to nothing, zero, right? Zilch. Again, the importance of love. 1 John 4, 19 to 21. I won't turn you there, but I'll have you read the next one. Uh, it says essentially, and if anyone says, he loves God whom he has not seen, but does not love his brother whom he has seen. He's a liar. If you're not loving your brother, you can claim all you want to love God, but if that love isn't being displayed in a tangible love for one another, your claim to love God is bogus. Can someone please read John 13, 34, and 35. Can you volunteer? Let's shoot up your hand. And thank you, Josh. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I love you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay. What is that telling us? Jesus' words. It identifies. That's how we we are identified with Him. Is our love? Yeah, love. You know, sometimes Reformed theology identifies a true church by by three marks, right? The preaching of the Word of God the uh, celebration of the ordinances, and the practice of church discipline. Those are all marks of a true church, but I don't think we should leave out love, right? I mean, if you don't have love, then you're not showing yourself to be God's people. Jesus said, this is the distinguishing mark of my people, that they love one another. And 1 Peter 1.22 says, we are to love one another with pure hearts fervently. Not only are we to love one another in principle, but as believers, there's to, to, to be some heat. There's to be some affection there. The kind of affection we may not have even toward the ungodly. <coughs> so, love calls us to minister to one another. Why? Because love does not seek its own. <coughs> love is other focused. Yeah, I'm going to need a little water. <coughs> love is focused outward. So, love calls us to personal ministry to one another. And the wonderful thing about the gospel is it frees us to love for the first time. Are you aware of that? That nobody apart from Christ can really do agape. There can be natural affection, but agape love, the kind of love God has that is selfless and altruistic, we cannot do that apart from the gospel changing us. Thank you. Otherwise, we're, we live for ourselves. But the gospel frees us for the first time to turn outward and to be invested in others. So the basic foundational duty of love calls us to personal ministry. Secondly, the one another duties point us in the direction of personal ministry. You may be aware of this, but there's one Greek word, alelon, and if you look at it in English, it's translated one another. If you look at your concordance under one another, it's a very rich study. It basically outlines a lot of the responsibilities we have to one another. Since this is not a sermon, but a Sunday school class, let's see how many one another's we can come up with. Love one another is the canopy. 
There's probably about 30 of them. Jeremy? Exhort one another. Exhort one another daily. Hebrews 3.13. Esteban. Submit to one another. Submit to one another. From yesterday morning in the fear of Christ. There's one. What else? Bear one another's <laughs> burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. There's about 30 of them, so I don't think we'll exhaust them. <laughs> Is it pray for one another? Pray for one another, yeah. That you may be healed, right? James yeah. 5. Let's come up with a few more. Teaching one another in yeah. psalms and hymns. Yeah, speaking to one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, yeah. A few more. Forgive no, this, this works. Uh, forgive one another. For, forgive one another. Yeah. Forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Yeah. Admonish one another. Admonish one another. Yeah. <laughs> Romans 15, 14. Admonish. Put the kind truth to one another. What is it? Be kind to Be one another. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving. Good sample. But we've got about 30 of those one another's, which really fleshes out fellowship. And the point here is. You probably can't do this apart from upfront and personal, plus and personal one-to-one -one relationship. Okay, that's the point. So the one another duties point us in the direction of spiritually intentional relationships. The call to use our gifts for one another. Two passages. Someone get First Peter four ten. Thanks, um, uh, Daniela and. And from um, 1 Corinthians um, 12, 4 to 7, Z. We're, we're called to use our gifts for one another. As First. each has received the gift, use it to serve one another, a good steward of God's varied grace. As each has received a gift, use it for one another. Everybody, we are a, the church, every church is a charismatic community. Are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. Because the word charisma is the Greek word for gift. I'm not saying you're charismatic in the modern sense, but in the biblical sense, every church is a charismatic community because every Christian has a gift, at least one gift. And how is it to be used? Zeke? Um, now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who empowers them all and everyone, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. There you go. Why are the gifts given? Why does each one of you have at least one spiritual gift? For the benefit of all. others. To benefit others for the common good. Now, some gifts are public gifts. I am exercising now a public gift. But many of the gifts are not public. And they will be best used in a more personal way. And that again points us in the direction of spiritually intentional interpersonal relations. We've got gifts, and most of the gifts will not be public, but will be best utilized in interpersonal ways. And then another line of thought. The example of the ministry of Jesus. In Mark 3.14, Jesus prayed all night, and he chose 12. And anybody remember, without looking at the text, why he chose them? He chose 12 so that they might be... Who said it? Very good, Jamaica. That, that they might be... It's not, it's not written down, is it? No. I'm reading it. I'm reading it. Okay. So that they might be with him. The with him. He chose them that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Now in Acts 4.13, Jesus has gone to heaven and Peter and John are dragged before the authorities, the Sanhedrin. And here were uneducated guys, fishermen, and they're speaking eloquently and knowledgeably about the things of God. And do you remember what the response was of the Sanhedrin when they acknowledged that Peter and John, how's it go? Get me started. Had been with Jesus. Had been with Jesus. That's the key phrase. When they had seen, boy, you know how you memorize a verse and then after time, if you don't use it, you lose it. Now, as they observed the boldness of Peter and John, 
and understood that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What did they see? Something, it's like this is a deja vu, right? Deja vu all over again, as you'll be very used to say. Uh, we've seen this before. We've seen this kind of boldness before. Where did we see it? Oh yeah, Jesus of Nazareth. Something of Jesus' boldness had rubbed off on them. And they saw it. Why? Because he had chosen them to be with him. And for three years they had been with Jesus, listening to Jesus, learning from Jesus, asking questions of Jesus, being sent out by Jesus, failing and being corrected by Jesus, asking questions of Jesus. And Jesus had rubbed off on them because they were with him. You see how that's pointing us in the direction of personal ministry. As you spend time with someone else, Jesus said the disciple, when he is fully trained, will be what? Like his teacher, like his master. So this example of Jesus in personal ministry, the Apostle Paul as well set an example for us. Um, somebody read Acts 16, 1 to 3, please. Michael, thank you. And, and Philippians 2, 19 to 21. Somebody knew. Um, stay long. We're looking at the example of the ministry of Paul. Acts 16, 1 through 3. Yeah. Paul came also to Derby and Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that he that his father was a Greek. Okay, what is that account telling us? Nothing deep, but right on the surface, was, what that was the occasion of what? Timothy or Paul taking Timothy under his wing. Paul, very good, well put. Paul taking Timothy under his wings. He had come upon this man, Timothy. Timothy was well spoken of by the brethren. And Paul saw something in this young man, and he said, I, I want to take this guy with me. I, I want to work with this man. And good way to put it, he took him under his spiritual wing. And the result of that, as stayed on Philippians 2, listen carefully and make the connection between Acts 16 and what you're about to hear. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who would be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Make the connection. He wants to send somebody to Philippi. He's going to send Timothy. Why? He has no one like him. Nobody like Timothy who will what? Be genuinely concerned for them like him. Yeah. How that how that happen? He was with him. You see it? He chose Timothy as Jesus chose the twelve to be with him. Paul told, chose Timothy to be with him. And when he needed somebody to go to Philippi to represent him, I want somebody who's going to represent my heart to them as I represent Jesus. And sadly, he has no one else. Kind of a sad commentary. Imagine the other guys reading that. You know, not me, not me. But he had Timothy because Timothy had been with him, and he represented Timothy because Paul had rubbed off on Timothy, and he had trained Timothy. Personal ministry in Acts 20, 20, and, and 31. You notice that Paul, in a, in a pastoral role in Ephesus says in verse 20 and then verse 31. He says in Acts 20, 20, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Jeremy is a young pastor, but he has begun to do what the scriptures would have him do. Not only teach publicly, but to teach from house to house. That's faithful pastoral ministry. A lot of churches don't get that. The man comes out from behind the curtain and he preaches perhaps a wonderful eloquent sermon on Sunday and then you don't see him again. But faithful pastoral ministry, somebody has said that's 2020 vision. 
2020 vision with regard to the church, not only public ministry, but personal ministry. So a faithful pastor is going to minister individually and personally in your homes. And verse 31 underscores that. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. I not only taught you publicly, but I appeal to you individually with tears. There's personal, now granted, that's pastoral ministry, but it's another example of personal ministry, not just public ministry. And in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, I'll just read that. Um, Paul again reveals his pastoral heart when he says, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. Are you seeing these lines of biblical thought pointing in the direction of ministering personally to each other? And then we have the principle of imitation. Someone read Proverbs 13, 20. Uh, thank you, Zeke. Um, and 1 Corinthians 11, 1. We'll pull that one out. Michael J.R. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Okay. Pretty clear, isn't it? You walk with the wise, you'll become wise. You're going, to, you're going to become like the people you associate with. And again, as we're talking about influencing one another, if you are accompanying with those who are wise, you will partake of that wisdom. But if you hang out with fools, you will become foolish. And then, Michael. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Okay, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. How could one imitate Paul? except one be exposed to Paul's life. Now, you can hear him preach, and you can say, well, I want to imitate his preaching or teaching, but he's talking about more than imitating his public ministry. Im imitate my entire lifestyle. How can you do that unless you have some exposure to his lifestyle, unless you're hanging out with him and, and seeing him in various situations of life? Again, it's pointing to personal ministry, spiritually intentional relationships. Here's one, and let me have uh, one of the ladies read this. The explicit call to older women to train younger women. One of the ladies, volunteer, yeah. Um, Titus 2, 3 to 5. Listen up especially, you ladies, as, as Debbie reads that. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and, to, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be revived. Okay, ladies, did you hear that? Now, some of you are, are older ladies, and... Older is relative to the flock you're in, isn't it? You may be 35 and one of the older ones, right? Um, it's relative. But older women are specifically charged to train the younger women. That word is interesting. It's not, a, it's not cognitive uh, instruction so much as it, it, it's the word um, that has to do with sobriety. In other words, help them to soberly... Uh, uh, take to heart their responsibilities, and it's, it's a training word. Older women are specifically to train the young women in what areas? In what areas? <coughs> Self control? Workers at home? Submissive to husbands? Love their husbands, love their children, right? Areas where, where women need to be trained, especially in our day. Especially in our day, right? Where we have wandered so far from biblical truth and biblical morality and biblical norms. How the women, young women who are coming to Christ are going to need basic training in these areas that a generation ago could be somewhat assumed. Even then, they needed to be taught from a Christian perspective. But now, you have to start from ground zero in teaching 
these young women. Well, you who are older women, relatively speaking, you are charged to do that. And that is definitely personal ministry, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then one more principle. Proverbs 27, 17. I'll start it, you finish it. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. One man sharpens another. It's uh, metal on metal, right? Sharpening. There's a, a process of, of sharpening that is to take place among the people of God. So... Do you see, first of all, the paramount importance of love in the Christian life? Love your brothers and love your no. sisters, not merely in word but in, in um, and tongue, but in deed and truth, John says. Do you see the need to somehow carry out all the one another's of Scripture? Do you see, recognize the fact that you each have a spiritual gift? Very few of them will be exercised publicly. Most of them will be exercised privately and, and personally. And you've got a gift, at least one. And you've got to use it to build up your brothers and sisters. Most of it will be private. Do you see the example of Jesus in choosing a handful of men and then personally investing himself in them to the point where he rubbed off on them because of his investment in them? And do you see Paul doing the same thing with a Timothy? so that Timothy was shaped and fashioned into the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul because of his personal investment in Timothy. And do you see the principle of imitation generally? You will imitate. We are imitators. We are mimics by nature. There, there's no question. You're all going to imitate. We're all going to imitate. It's a question of who and what we imitate. We will imitate. And you want to imitate the wise. And so you need investment in and the company of the wise. And older women especially, you are explicitly charged to train the younger women. And do you want to be involved in that iron sharpening? We all need sharpening. We're all dull swords, aren't we? And we all need constantly to be sharpened. And personal ministry will tend to sharpen us. Now, the rest of my time I'm going to spend on practically how to implement this. But any thoughts? I guess I said it would be interactive. Mostly I've had you read scripture. But do you have any thoughts um, before we, we move on and basically just talk about how to implement this? Ashley. Would it be appropriate uh, if a single woman would go, um, like, because she's single, that she would be bouncing from house to house as far as, like, uh, different older Christian women and also... Another question is, is it appropriate for a single woman to evangelize outside of the house? Or the women in general? Yeah, let me answer the first. The, the second, we're, we're not so much talking about evangelism now, but we're talking about edifying education within the body. But, yeah, I mean, I think for a young woman to be cross-trained, so to speak, you know, to be influenced by more than one older woman, that's absolutely healthy. Because we're, we are all poor representations of Jesus by ourselves, right? And as a, as a preacher, as a pastor, I don't imitate but one man. I want to imitate, and I encourage my son as a young preacher, imitate a lot of men. Take what's good from every man and, and imbibe it. And I think we need to be taking the good from various ones and not just have one per That was a weakness. I worked with the Navigator organization. A good organization, very much into this kind of thing, but oftentimes it's one person investing in another person. I don't want people to look exactly like me when they're done. I think there are some good things I can impart, but there are other men who can impart other things that I can't. So I think, is that answering your question in part? Cross training, as it were. Yeah, Michael. I mean, we see the need. You made, you made the need clear, but how do we take care of fulfilling that need because you can have on the one end the younger brethren thinking well I don't want to be a burden to say older men they seem like they have their hands full they seem like they're busy so I don't want to come saying hey I'm needy okay. and I come under your wing and then you may have the older men thinking well I don't want to come act like I'm the answer to every every younger Christian's problems and exert okay. myself okay and, for time's sake, let's get into the practical implementation, okay? See if we can try to answer that. Here's some, what I'm calling some suggested approaches to personal ministry. First of all, how, how is this going to happen? And by the way, I, I think it's already happening among you more than it is in, in other churches. 
because I think it's happening a lot in San Antonio, and I think you guys have a wonderful role model, and you are a microcosm, and becoming a microcosm of that church, which is one of the healthiest churches I know of in my 45 years as a Christian on planet Earth. <coughs> So I think you are imitating a good role model. A lot of this is being done, and you're already doing it. So I will stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but first of all, you've got to begin by fellowshipping generally, right? If, if you're not showing up for the meetings of the church and not fellowshipping in the, the larger gatherings, you're not likely to do it on a personal level, right? Start from just being with the people of God and hanging out with the people of God generally. Otherwise, you'll never do it more personally and specifically. That's where it begins. And then, look to establish spiritually intentional relationships along three possible lines. Mentor to mentee. Okay? Some of the relationships will be older man, older woman, to younger man, younger woman. You're an older saint. You're more seasoned. You, won't, you may be only 38 years old, but you know you got a lot of 20-somethings, and so you're one of the old ones. Okay? And you have a lot to give to those younger ones. Um, mentor to mentee. But then mentee to mentor. In our church, we said, look, you younger guys, if older men aren't coming to you, you go after them and grab them by the coattails and say, hey, brother, I've been watching you you know, you're quiet, but I, I look at the way you've raised your children, and I just see a lot that you can teach me. Can we get together for lunch? So let it go in both directions. Um, you know, older ones seek out younger ones, but younger ones, you seek out older ones if they're not coming to you. And then peer relationships as well. There's, there's value to that. We're, we're meeting as peers. That kind of covers everything, doesn't it? Older to younger, younger to older peer relationships. I think that's kind of exhaustive. But how is it going to happen? And if I don't answer that question, Michael, let's explore it a little bit more, because I may not answer it satisfactorily. Initiate relationships. We're talking about establishing spiritually intentional relationships, right? Brother to brother, sister to sister. How do we initiate these? Well, and here you can fill in. First of all, you may be an older more seasoned saint, you see a young believer, you'd like to encourage in the Lord. That's one way. Seeing a young believer, you'd like to encourage in the Lord. Or, like I said, you may be a young believer who sees an older believer and says, I think I can learn some things from you. And I, I'd like to spend some time with you. Or you may see a peer in a similar situation in life and say, brother, sister, let, let's, let's connect, let's meet together. You may um, have a shared spiritual interest. I remember in San Antonio, some of you guys, uh, were you involved in that, Zeke? Zeke, Jeremy, and some, you guys had a shared spiritual interest um, in teaching. And so I remember you guys got together and said, we're going we're gonna to preach to each other. And then we're going to evaluate each other. And we're going to get together on that basis. You may get together on the basis of a shared struggle. Right? Maybe you're struggling in the same area. Maybe there's a, a young man struggling in the area of, of sexual lust. How many men struggle in that area and say, I've been wrestling, trying to kick this habit of pornography. Um, well, you know, I've got that problem too. Well, let's meet together and let's hold one another accountable in that area of shared struggle. You may meet with someone you look at a person and you say, you know, that young man, that young woman is where I once was. You know? And, and I think I can help that person become what God has helped me to become. Not that I've arrived, but I look at that person and I say, that's where I was. And God gives you a heart for that younger believer because you were there. You can relate and you can help pull them out. Um, maybe geographically, you know, somebody works close to where you work. And you could say, hey, you know, we're only working two blocks from each other. Let's have lunch together on a regular basis. Just the geography of it makes it convenient to me. Um, you may see somewhat an acute need in a brother or sister's life. Somebody's really struggling intensely with something. An acute need. And you say, somebody's got to meet that need in that brother or sister. 
Can I, can I connect with you? Can we get together for breakfast, for lunch? Maybe it's just a desire to get to know a brother or sister you don't know so well. Now, that's more a problem in a, in a larger church, right? Which, God willing, you will become by the blessing of God. But here's a brother or sister I just don't know very well. And I want to get to know them. A newcomer into church. See, what I long for in, in the church I'm privileged to pastor and for every church is that this kind of ministry becomes part of the culture of the church. It's what we do. I, I picture a net, a network of interpersonal relations, a net in which people get caught in a good sense. So somebody comes into the church and they get caught in the net. What does that mean? It means somebody is going to say, hey, friend, they may be a believer, they may not be a believer. You may not know. Uh, yeah, I noticed you've come out to church a couple times. Can we, can we meet for breakfast this week? Can we meet for lunch? I'd like to get to know you. And so every, nobody falls through a hole. Everybody gets caught in the net. Isn't that a good net to be caught in? Isn't it, and it, it needs to become the culture of the church. It's, it's what we do. And I think it's, it's a blessed thing. So that beneath the surface of the church, what you see on a Sunday morning is a network of interconnectedness that is making that goodness a strong foundation. People are connected. They're not just bouncing off one another like marbles on Sunday, but they're interconnected. All kinds of relationships, if you were to look under the surface. And I like the image of a net in which people get caught in a good way. Um, and so that might lead to the desire to evangelize an unbeliever. You know, that person, an unbeliever comes in, you find out they're an unbeliever. And, you, and then meeting with them personally is an opportunity to evangelize them one-on-one. -on -one. So those are all uh, ways to uh, initiate relationships. Um, based on, and then invite a brother or sister to get together informally for breakfast, for lunch, for coffee. What are we talking about? We're not talking about anything huge. We're just talking about getting together. Whatever's convenient. Breakfast, lunch. I've been doing this for years. I, I love doing this, and I don't, but I don't think I do it as a pastor. I've done it in my ministry to the Amish in Lancaster County. Sometimes you have to get rid of really early to meet with these Amish. For years, I have a 6 o'clock meeting with an Amish, uh, a Mennonite guy 45 minutes away. You know? But it's the only time that works for him. Well, Connect for breakfast, connect for lunch, connect whenever, whenever it's convenient. And then consider committing to meeting on some regular basis with a spiritually intentional goal. Here's the idea of the spiritual intentionality. Okay? It's not just having coffee and chewing the fat, you know, talking socially. Well, that's part of it. You've got a spiritually intentional goal. The idea is to speak the word of God to one another and to build up one another. And here are some possibilities. I think I've got them listed. Mutual accountability, like I said. You're struggling with that? I'm struggling with that too. We need accountability. We need to look each other in the eye and say, how do you do this week with regard to this particular area of struggle? That would be one basis for me, mutual accountability. Um, mentoring an older to a younger, right? Um, in a particular area. You know, a young man might say, you know what, I just don't know how to manage my money. I'm wasting a lot of money. You seem to be a, a one who has your finances in hand. Will you teach me how to, how to manage my finances? Or, you know, I've, I've got a young family here. I have no idea as to how to bring up these kids. But I notice your children are well behaved. And could you tell me a little bit about how you did it or how you're doing it? So an area of mentoring. Or sharpening each other as peers, another possibility. Doing a Bible study together. Let's get together and study uh, this theme of the Bible or this book of the Bible together. Or let's study a Christian book together. You know, here's a book that addresses an area we both have concern about. You know, two men struggling with lust. Well, here's a book. You know, I have a, an accountability group on Saturday morning with men who have struggled with sexual lust and been, some of them have been wonderfully delivered, Amish and non-Amish, and we've gone through a lot of books through the years that address that area. Let's read this book together. Let's do a service project together or some spiritual ministry together. Sometimes do something fun together. 
Let's be in one another's homes. A lot of possibilities, but you just want to get together with some spiritually intentional goal. And then share your life with one another. Like Paul said, I not only imparted the Word of God, but my, my own life to you. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about life impartation. Jesus shared his life. Paul shared his life. And Jesus' disciples and Paul's followers came to imitate not just their public ministry, but their life. And you want to share your life with that other person. Give them a glimpse of your life and your family life. And give them a window on your life. And it's not going to be perfect, but they're going to see something that's hopefully worthy of imitation. Now, let's talk about some possible hindrances to this ministry. And maybe Michael's can be addressed here. Some of these you don't have. Some churches, pastors do all the ministry. You don't have that mindset. But some churches do. You know, we're spectators. That's what we pay him to do. He's the, the minister. Well, you know better. We're all ministers, right? But that's a hindrance in some circles. Some circles, churches are too choked with meaningless church activities, unfruitful church activities, right? They've got this committee and the flower committee and the history committee and the this committee and the that committee that are just wasting people's time. You don't have that problem in our circles, we tend not. But, here's another one, a lack of spiritual vitality in your own life. If, if you're not walking closely with the Lord, and the Lord isn't real to you, you're not going to want to impart that to others. You're going to feel, I've got nothing to impart, because God isn't real to me. You need to fix that. You need to repent. You need to cleanse your conscience of whatever is a barrier so that you're walking with the Lord, so that you have some joy in the Lord, and, and He's real to you, so that you have something to give to others. So your own spiritual dryness or deadness will kill this ministry. Of course, if that's where you are, and you see someone who is walking in the joy of the Lord, you can say, my life has been dry. Yours seems to be an overflowing spring. Can we get together so, so I can learn from you? Um, a lack of love for others will hinder it. Too consumed with my own selfish pursuits. We're called to love one another, to invest in one another in the body of Christ. If, if we're selfish, and, and Christ delivers us from that maybe selfishness, but we still have remaining selfishness, right? Look, I just need time for myself. You know, I just want my own comfort, my own ease. And a lack of love for others will kill personal ministry. Laziness is another. A false humility. You see this in some of the older men. Maybe they're not teacher types. Oh, you know, I don't really have anything to give. Wait a minute. You may not be a, a fount of theological knowledge, but you've lived decades, gone out there in the workaday world, and lived for Christ in the midst of a brutal world for years. Don't say you don't have anything to give. You've maintained a Christian testimony in the workplace for decades. Don't say you don't have anything to give to a young believer. But some of the older men sometimes say, oh, what do I have like to give? You know, I'm not a teacher. Yeah, but you may have a lot to imitate. A false humility. Um, an absence of a hunger to grow. If you're a young believer, but you don't want to grow, then you're not going to take seriously the need to be trained by somebody else. You ought to be hungry to grow and to learn from older ones. Or a prideful lack of teachableness. Proverbs 18, 1 and 2. He who separates himself seeks his own desires. I don't need to learn. I don't need to grow. Yes, you do. We all do. We all need to be learning and growing. But a prideful lack of teachableness will short-circuit this. And not seeing the value of, and so not making informal personal spiritual intentional relationship the priority in your schedule. Well, that's the purpose of taking this out. To try to impress on you that this is valuable, this is needful, and hopefully you will see the importance of it and make time to invest in it. And Michael, maybe that's the best shot at an answer to your question. You know, um, we, we have a lot of things calling upon us. Um, but um, if we see that this is important, We've got the big meetings of the church, we've got the small group meetings, 
but personal ministry needs to play a significant part in the life of our church. I need to make some time for it. Just one person. Once a week. Once every two weeks. Start where you, you can. So, any thoughts, any questions? I realize maybe it hasn't been as interactive, but there's a lot here to communicate. Jeremy. Yeah, I just, I want to say as, um, I think we have, as all churches, we have areas to grow in this, um, but I've been very encouraged. I, I've, I've gone to the pastoral visits and sat and met with people. There have been multiple occasions when I've been praying a certain way for maybe six months for an individual or a family with very pointed, specific issue that I'm praying. And so it's, I see something and I say, do I need to confront this? Okay, I'm well, let me just pray about this for some time. And then eventually, it, and then I sit down with the person and they say, yeah, over the months I've seen this issue, this issue, this issue, and this person in the church has been such a help to me in that. And for me, it's a comfort to know God's directly answering. So if I see an issue come up, I don't just have to, I'm going to confront it right away. But as I pray for it, to see the body coming alongside one another and being used in ways that they may not recognize they're being used. Even just exa you know, being an example. And what a joy to a pastor that he's not the only one having to fix things, but the body's ministering to itself. Uh, and one of our jobs as pastors is to equip the saints so they're going to ministry. Yeah, that's really healthy. And like I said, I think you probably are doing more of it than most churches. To many churches, it would be a totally foreign concept. But again, you're following a good model that has been practiced for over a decade in San Antonio. And I think you're a microcosm of that. But it's a blessing to your pastor, which it sh you should let him do his work with joy. And that's one of the ways the pastor has joy when he sees the saints ministering to one another. So he's not the only one having to put out brush fires and deal with people's issues. The body's ministering to each other. Other thoughts? I was just going to say, to Michael's point, it's helpful to just know that um, we're supposed to, to be reminded that we actually are supposed to be doing it. So, like, as far as, um, you know, you approach someone, and I wouldn't think, you know, why are you asking me if you can mentor me if I know that I'm supposed to be hungry for growth and, and I'm supposed to be looking for mentors or I'm supposed to be looking to mentor. I wouldn't say to a younger brother, hey, what are you doing? You know, I'm busy. You know, I got yeah. kids, you know, yeah. um, because I'm supposed to be, this is what we're here for. We're here for each other and here for the Lord. And yes. so that's just helpful to me to yeah. remember. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like you got a thought in your, yeah, behind those eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah. We can approach somebody, and even though they don't necessarily tell us no, through their actions, it's a no because they don't make the time, or they are kind of avoiding, and they're not really intentional. And I think there's a place where we need to have like a healthy rebuke and remind them that they need to be, if not with us, with somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. And the, the more it becomes the culture of the church, the more it will become the norm. And people who aren't doing that will be more left out, and they won't grow to the same degree. And hopefully people will see the benefit of it. I've been meeting with brother so-and-so, sister so -and -so. Oh, she has blessed me so much. Really? Well, I, I want a little bit of that blessing. I was just going to say, sometimes, too, it's it's helpful to know, uh, or it's at least for me, I'm realizing, like, I have a hunger now to seek out a, a mentor. Um, but it's helpful to know that they, that they really care. Because um, sometimes, like, say a... Uh, you say an older man, he looks busy, and he wants to help. If you see, if you don't, if you feel like he's got so many more important things that he could be doing, I just don't want to, and it's a, I mean, I don't know, false humility or whatever, but I don't want to inconvenience him. You might not be as diligent because of that. I don't know if that's yeah. for everybody, but at least for me, um, that's been the, Feeling, but when you see like, whoa, they really, no, they really care, and we're supposed to, and they really believe that, yeah. then it's like, oh, okay, yeah. And it's what it's all about. See, I'm not a great visionary. I'm not one of these great creative entrepreneurial thinkers when it comes to the church. But this is giving me joy because I know this is God's vision for the church. People are what count. Investment in people will never be wasted. 
It's investment in people. People are those for whom Christ died. His saints are the apple of his eye. And so you know this is God's mind in terms of growing the church qualitatively and quantitatively. And that's why I'm excited about this because it gives me vision as one who doesn't see himself as a great visionary. But I know this is the heart of God. So it needs to be important to invest in someone, in one of the saints. One couple men wrote a book, The, the, um, the Trellis and the Vine. And the theme of that book is churches can be so concerned with the trellis, the structure of the church. And they need to be concerned about the living thing. And the living thing are the, the living stones, the people. And that's worth everybody's time. Every soul is precious. Any other thoughts? Okay, let's pray. Father, if this is indeed your heart as we see it in the scriptures, continue to make personal ministry, spiritually intentional relationships, part of the culture of Grace Community Church of Marengo, to the great blessing and maturity of the saints and the expansion of your kingdom in this city. For Jesus' sake, amen.